an easier day today, I hope, than, than yesterday uh, when we were dealing with uh, ESCOM. Um, and then um, what we'll do is we will hand over to the minister uh, who is present and we welcome the minister and the deputy minister and all the officials, uh, National Treasury, SIU, I mean, Auditor General, our principal stakeholders. Um, thank you very much uh, for being here as well. Um, so we are receiving a briefing this morning um, from the minister on a set of issues uh, which largely were the um, recommendations and directives of the committee around the UIF um, and the issue around the forensic investigations. Uh, so there are also, of course, issues um, which we've been briefed on around the TERS and uh, the SIU had briefed us on. So we'll, rather, we'll start with the first issue and then we'll go to the TERS issue um, as well um, after that so that we can uh, be able to be focused on the issues which uh, we are dealing with. Um, so I would imagine the persons who are assisting the minister to with the presentations have already been given the um, sharing rights and so on and so forth, um, and that we will be good to go. So honorable colleagues, um, good morning um, and welcome, and um, I hope we will have a good meeting. So we'll take uh, questions uh, immediately after the the presentations. I know that um, yesterday the House dealt with the report um, of the Portfolio Committee on our visit to the UIF. Uh, our report was ACT uh, thousand years ago, um, and we have been asked to re-ACT it for one odd reason or the other. Um, and we will be ATCing all the reports which we had ATCed before um, so that they can be well scheduled for the House. Um, we will, I'm told uh, there was some technicality around lapses and so on. Whatever that is, is neither here nor there. So the reports will be in the AC to ACT tomorrow. Um, if not Friday, and hopefully tabled to the House uh, next week with the earliest convenience that the programming committee uh, will determine. The oversight visit to the post office has been approved, and Sis Dombi will be um, communicating the relevant details uh, with Lungisa, with the members, so that we can finalize that. All right, I think that's all from my side and so far as housekeeping is concerned. If there's any other matters, we'll deal with them at the end. Uh, Honorable Minister and Deputy Minister, we will hand over to you and then we will come in after for questions. So colleagues, uh, let us proceed in that fashion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson and uh, the Honorable Members of SCOPA, the Deputy Minister. And... Um, all the officials who are here. The first issue I want to raise, the chairperson who have sent an apology of uh, the DG who uh, had to go and replace me in an ILO meeting in uh, Mombasa because there's an item which we are leading there and we, we had to decide that I come and then he goes to, to that side. Briefly, Chairperson, I'm going to request Advocate uh, Yawa to lead us, but let me just make this short comment. Uh, on the SIE report, you will find that of topical interest. Um, but bear in mind that uh, they were following up on the AG's findings over a year ago. The AG audited the, uh, the initial COVID tariff payments and exposed certain risks and weaknesses. And of course, uh, made recommendations to tighten up controls. And these recommendations were implemented by the UIF. And this was acknowledged, of course, by the AG in the second audit of the COVID test payments. So 
the, the role of the SIU was then to investigate individuals now or entities involved in the corruption and charge them. I should mention also that uh, the UIF has also put in place a second line of defense, which is the follow the money uh, strategy, a commitment to audit every COVID test payment, which which netted, which netted uh, even more culprits. And then uh, response to the AG's findings and recommendations. And what you see from the presentation is, is, is a systematic uh, response to the AG, the establishment of the clean audit task teams, development of audit action plans, and close monitoring of the implementation of those plans through the weekly reporting and weekly management meetings. And of course, holding managers accountable. And I should mention, Jefferson, that just a month ago, the DG convened a governance, the whole cloud focus, on compliance, I mean compliance, accountability, and uh, ensuring mechanism in place for regular reporting and uh, monitoring plans. And what you also see is that the internal risk and audit is now playing a much greater role in guiding the work and planning across uh, the funds and the department. On progress, the graphs um, showing where we are in terms of the action plans clearly indicate the progress in tackling the matters raised by the age, but also we feel that this is not enough because there are some areas where we are saying it's work in progress, but we have not put enough. I mean, we have not put the, the clear deadlines, which I think um, it's a bit of a weakness, and we have to, to put clear uh, deadlines there. The repeat find findings on the PIC investment in unlisted companies has to be addressed. These are often SMMEs, startups, and black-owned social responsibility investment. And the problem is their reporting and accounting periods do not align with those of government. So our first response has been to work with those companies to assist them to become compliant. And there, there are clearly systemic issues that have to be addressed, particularly in the case of the CF. And the fund simply does not have enough of the right skills, particularly in relation to finance and auditing. So we are currently in conversation with the National Treasurer to address this. And of course, the point has been made by the committee, amongst other things, that IT systems and very platform we use are inadequate to support the work of the department. This is being addressed, but clearly there's no quick fix. Just lastly, we, we, all, we, we, we have also come to appreciate that the very architect and operating systems of the funds need to be fundamentally reviewed to, to bring them in line with the best practice across the insurance and the finance sectors. And of course, to this end, a service provider, experts in the field will be appointed by the end of, of this particular month. We had to make sure that uh, the, the processes are properly, properly followed so that uh, there are no irregularities in the appointment of service providers that it has happened before. But let me ask uh, Advocate Yawa, who is the acting commissioner, to start his presentation. Advocate Yawa. Thank you very much, Minister. Good morning, Minister, Deputy Minister, Chair of the Committee, members of the committee, and everybody present. Um, the yes, Chair of the committee, as you said, those who are for human rights, have been asked to help us steam the presentation. If they could do that, uh, I could uh, really be fast on pace. Why is that doing so, Honorable Chair? The report and this Just presentation is in response to what Scopa. Uh, Just one second. Um, the Parliament Communications has requested that we all turn on our cameras when we are speaking on the platform. So if we could do that, please. And can we get the presentation flighted, please? I turn my camera on, Chairperson, but I suspect maybe there's a no, we can see you. lagging in my system. I don't 
don't see my face on my No, we can see you. You came to Parliament without a tie. You see that. <laughs> It's like it's not properly aligned. So it's cutting at the end. But it's there. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. All right, let's get going. Uh, advocate Yawa. Advocate Yawa. Chair. Um, Chairperson, Minister Dame, this is Marsha Brungo speaking. I'm acting as DG. In the absence of Advocate Yawa, would you want me to start the presentation and when he joins us again, let him continue? Chairperson, let me just uh, apologize. I know that from yesterday. Recording in progress. From 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 yesterday, we've been having this problem uh, of the line cutting and so on. And but uh, I suspect you will come back. I will request that uh, Marcia continues with the presentation in the meantime. Thank you. No, that will be in order. We we had a similar problem with uh, ESCOM yesterday uh, when they were here. No irony lost them, of course, that in large part um, the network issues are attributable to load shedding or the blackouts. So uh, we quite understand and just say that the committee effective next year is um, likely to, no, not likely, will be impressing more and more on physical meetings because this online platform is just not conducive for effective and meaningful engagement. So we understand and we'll hand over to the acting DG. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson, and good morning to you and the honourable members, the Minister and the Deputy Minister. I am going to do the presentation of the Unemployment Insurance Fund uh, in response to the matters raised during the previous meeting and the content of this presentation if i can go if we can go back uh, nomsi to the slide where we have the contents would be the scopa resolutions we'll address that we'll address the clean audit action plan we'll address irregular wasteful expenditure the investigation of cases around that we will also reflect on consequence management and then the Accenture matter. These are the five matters that were raised by the committee during its meeting in May. And we would like to focus in terms of our presentation on these five matters. If we move to slide number four, which talks about the SCOPA resolutions. This just gives us a breakdown. Firstly, there was the audit uh, response plan, and we will look at slides five to 15. We developed a clean audit action plan at the UIF, and the pro progress is attached in slides five to 15. Then the matter of the blacklisting of companies, the progress report also attached, slides 16 and 17. 
We have then an extensive progress report on the irregular, wasteful, and fruitless expenditure register and the investigation thereof. You'll see that these cover slide 18 to 43. Consequence management, including that of the commissioner, would be on slides 44 to 46. And then finally, our reflection on the Accenture case would be slides 47 to 49. So let's start with the matter of the clean audit action plan, and this would be on slide number six. And Jay, if we do find problems, I think I'll continue with the presentation as all members have received the presentation. You will see that our audit matrix, when we compile the action uh, plan, we have had total, in terms of our investments in associates, interest in joint ventures and other financial assets there were 20 findings and then uh, in terms of the management implementation status and i would just like to stand a little bit here management provides and uh, states that this is what they have uh, resolved and then the uif clean audit committee which is a multi disciplinary team in terms of having members of internal audit, members of uh, risk, members of the technical experts and so forth, they then go and check and audit that what management has said in terms of the um, achievement of cleaning the audit findings. So you will see that management stated that they had cleaned 13 and seven are in progress. But when the audit, clean, the clean audit committee came to, if I can use the word audit generically and loosely, they found that yes, indeed, thirteen were achieved within the time frames, but that there are six that are still unsatisfactory due to uh, overdue dates that the management did not keep to the dates. On the right-hand side, you will see that there are actions that are still to be finalized between October and December, which are 10. If we move to benefit payments, provisions, and contingencies, there were four findings. Those have been resolved, and they have also been resolved to the satisfaction of the Clean Audit Committee, which uh, means that they were satisfied with the portfolio of evidence provided that indeed these matters were finalized. The third finding or the third area was the non-compliance with legislation in terms of the annual financial statements. There were six findings around that. Four have been resolved, uh, and four are still not resolved due to an overtime, uh, due to overdue dates. It was not achieved in the time frame that was stated. D is the non-compliance with legislation, the expenditure management. Five findings, and these five findings were resolved within the time frames to the satisfaction also of the Clean Audit Committee. If we move to the next slide, please, let me see. This would be investment property, two findings. There is one uh, that was satisfactorily resolved and one that is still outstanding due to the overdue time frame again. If commitments, we had seven findings. These seven findings have been resolved according to management as well as according to the UIF Clean Audit Committee. Credible performance reporting, there were eight findings. And here, five have been resolved and three are in the progress, but still within the time frames, So they're not overdue yet. Non-compliance with legislation, the strategic planning management, there were two findings and these two were resolved and resolved also to the satisfaction of the uh, clean audit task team. I, non-compliance with legislation is consequence management. There were 12 findings, nine have been resolved and three are still outstanding as they have exceeded the timeframes. And then lastly, the audit action plan, there were five findings around that these five have been addressed and also addressed to the satisfaction of the Clean Audit Committee. Now, of the 71 findings that there were, <clears throat> excuse me, 55 have been addressed. And there are 15, 16 still outstanding. So, 
And orange is not really, it, it's partially implemented, but it still means that it's not been achieved. So I think we must rather than say, although it's a work in progress, it still has not been achieved. 77% of the findings have been addressed by now, by the deadline. So if we can move to the next part of the presentation, <clears throat> the collective measures implemented by uh, or taken by management, that would be on slide number nine. Equity accounting was performed on 14 investments whose financial information was received by the 31st of August. Uh, six investees information was not available by the closing date of the financial system and will be excluded from the equity accounting process and they will be assessed under GRAP. Uh, the minister has already alluded to the issue of the investments in, in social responsible um, partners. Internal assessment of the valuation reports and the market value adjustments were performed and there were required corrections and they will be made in the final sta financial statements. The internal assessment of impairment calculations was performed and completed and prior year accounting treatment of benefits, payables, provisions, technical reserves and benefit payments was done. Then can we look at the attempts to reduce our irregular expenditure at the UIA? The irregular expenditure process flow was developed in line with the National Treasury Irregular Expenditure Framework. There has also been a financial misconduct advisory committee uh, created or established, and it was instituted with representatives from risk management, finance, HRM, and compliance, and this committee has been appointed and has started work. Irregular expenditure cases were reopened to strengthen the recommendations in line with the irregular expenditure framework. And then the assessment and recognition of irregular expenditure will be shortened to no more than five days within the receipt of the alleged non-compliance so that we make this a key priority of, of the unemployment insurance fund to recover and take action. In terms of our commitments and disclosures, what have we done to, to further clean the audit? Monthly commitment schedules was, uh, a monthly commitment schedule was implemented and it's reviewed by the head of the unit prior to the disclosure thereof. And we will make sure that the disclosures will be in terms of GRAP standards. And we have compiled a GRAP checklist to make sure that it is indeed uh, compliant to the GRAP standards, and it will be reviewed by the external parties. The fund has developed the financial year in project plan, which includes the quality review process by process owners and oversight structures, and a prepayment accounting policy has been developed, and the agreements between the UIF and training providers has been amended to address this. I think members of SCOPA will recall that there was an audit finding around the prepayment, particularly around the labor activation programs, and that we had to, to rework the policy to meet the requirements. In terms of the next, the leadership, the process document on monitoring the audit action plans was developed and communicated. As I alluded to earlier, a UIF clean audit committee was instituted and it reports to the Risk Management Committee and the Audit Committee on a quarterly basis, the two oversight structures of the Unemployment Insurance Fund. An initiative called, uh, called Control Self-Assessment was implemented to monitor the effectiveness of the key controls. And a, a dashboard is being developed, will be developed and finalized as a result of this process. Implementation of the audit action plans included as part of the director's performance agreements which are assessed quarterly. I think this has not been in their performance agreements, but in an attempt to tighten adherence to the audit action plan, this will be included in the directors and higher, of course. Can we look at the clean audit initiative, how we aim to look at that? <coughs> Excuse me. The, the Clean Audit Committee assisted them, the, the directors, to conduct this control assessment exercise. So how it will be done is each director will present its control environment dashboard to this committee, and it should will be in line with the UIF risk management processes. 
The control self-assessment exercise will be, deduct, uh, will be conducted by each director, director on a quarterly basis. And it is to, the purpose is to re reduce the number of the findings and to achieve a clean audit outcome. So let's move to a bit, thank you, to the control self-assessment results. No, no, just go back, please. What have we done? Uh, on the left are the directorates, and in terms of uh, the second column is the sub-process, where we have had findings and where we have wanted to check the controls. And on the right, you will see that we have uh, measured these controls in terms of adequacy and effectiveness uh, to see where we are lacking and to correct in those. Uh, Chairperson, I will not go through them one by one, uh, but you will see that there are a number of areas where the effectiveness of the controls are under, under scrutiny. For example, debt management, there's one control which is not effective. Under contributions received, there are two controls. Under overpayments, there is one control. Under revenue, again, uh, collections, it's two controls. So mostly around the finances and the receivables <coughs> uh, where there are controls which still need work to be done. The issue of the blacklisting of the companies, I think there were quite a number of discussions on this in the previous meeting. So. The list of the companies who were suspected of fraud on the uh, TERS benefit was compiled with the intention to submit them to National Treasury for naming and shaming. But then there was a recommendation that perhaps we must just get a legal opinion uh, on the matter. And uh, this was done and finalized. And the legal opinion stated that as the memorandum of agreement that's signed by the UIF did not provide for the naming and shaming when companies signed it, it would be unfair and illegal to name and shame these companies. Uh, Sorry? You may mute your mic. Thanks, Chairperson. Uh, and then the legal opinion also recommended that the UIF should institute legal proceedings on those employers, and I think we, we know that they have started with, with some of them. Chairperson, let me look now at fruitless, wasteful, irregular expenditure and the investigation of cases. We have had uh, at the fund irregular expenditure with an opening balance of 111 million rand at the 1st of April, 2021. There was a write-off of irregular expenditure of 96 million Rand, which leaves the fund with a closing balance uh, by September this year of 14 million Rand. We, in the next slide, we just give a breakdown, a little bit more information as to what was the main contributor. The main contributor to the increase in Accenture contact was 10 million Rand, for, was the 10 million from Accenture, and the media houses at rate of 6 million for the COVID which I, the, the committee knows. Uh, was forms part of the SIU investigation and also disciplinary action or consequential management that was taken. The uh, additional amount of 10 million that was approved uh, on the 2nd of November to pay for Accenture for work delivered so that they could hand over the processes to the new service provider to proceed with SAP implementation. Now, because the Accenture contract was deemed to be irregular, this money that was paid would by implication also be irregular, although it was paid for legitimate work that was done by the service provider. And then lastly, a request was sent to National Treasury for the condemnation of this irregular contract. If we move to the next one. We did receive a response from National Treasury for not condoning the amount that I have stated to the 86 plus the 10, because they could not get proof that consequence, consequence management was applied. The submission was subsequently sent to the uh, accounting authority to approve the removal of the irregular expenditure, because treasury regulations permit the accounting officer or accounting authority to proceed with the removal of this. And then risk management was requested to reopen and further investigate the cases where the recommendations were not clear 
means consequence management could be taken. And I think a little bit later, I'll talk a little bit more about consequence management. The next slide simply gives detail as to the irregular expenditure and the tap up the details of the irregular expenditure, when it was reported, Jefferson members, you will note that quite a lot of these come from 2017 and some even earlier. They, and, and they are now all part of the matter that is being investigated, matters that are being investigated by the internal risk uh, unit. The uh, top two was the Accenture matters, and these amounts have been uh, written off subsequently. But the rest of these are all being investigated, and consequential management or disciplinary processes are underway. I'm not going to go through it in detail. Let's just look at irregular expenditure in the next slide as of 31 August, which is not confirmed yet as irregular expenditure, but it's being investigated as um, irregular expenditure or non-compliance. There are three. Firstly is a Manzi. This is non-compliance to treasury regulations in terms of supply chain management. Then the form in hotel, there was a price increase and then there was no prior approval. This was for a workshop that was conducted. And because of the fact that no prior approval was given, the expenditure is deemed to be non-compliance. And then the issue of Telcom South Africa, this is services that have been continued without a contract. When the fund moved to the building they are occupying now, the, there was a telecom contract which has expired, but there was a failure to pick up that this contract had expired and the contract went on, but there was no contract. So this matter is currently under investigation to determine where and who caused this irregular expenditure and the way forward. On the next slide, you will see that we've had an opening balance there of 128 million. With a telecom, the cancellation fee, this is a penalty because of the cancellation of the contract of another 2 million. There's a closing balance at the moment of 130 million rand in terms of fruitless and wasteful expenditure. On slide 27, <clears throat> the investigation of cases, the department took a decision to re reopen investigations where consequence management was not applied. And all matters were allocated to the forensics firm. Some were later recalled and are being performed by our internal risk management unit due to the very high cost of the resources at the forensic company. Training has been provided to the bid adjudication and the UIF staff on supply chain processes. And the UIF has also implemented a probity process to verify the whole supply chain process from the start to the, to the end in terms of the allocation of uh, the contracts. If we move to the next slide, the irregular expenditure cases, uh, I think I have already alluded to some of them. The Accenture is a case that we are all very familiar with. It's the matter of the irregular contract and the service provider that was appointed without the valid tax clearance. And then the second one is the service provider where the service provider had to pay 10 million rand to enable the service provider to provide a handover to the newly provided service provider. So it was a case of if, if it was not paid, then all that expenditure would have been fruitless. It was paid, but as I alluded to earlier, because the contract was deemed to be irregular, this 10 million rand would also then add to the irregular expenditure. On the next slide, Chipperson, uh, there's a lot of detailed analysis of irregular and expenditure cases. And with your indulgence, I think I will not go into them one by one by one because they, they're quite a number. I think the ones that are burning are the issues around the Accenture contract. I want us then to go to fruitless and wasteful expenditure. You would have recalled that this was also an audit finding. This is the issue of the SAP licenses and support for software that was paid for and not paid by the department. It is part of the development of systems for, for the UIF and these licenses have not been, <coughs> excuse me, used. <coughs> excuse. 
The, the next one would be, again, for software. On the next slide, slide 41, again, for software, where there was no usage of uh, systems, that, but, but the UIF was built as per the percentage split. Then there is a number of um, cases of fruitless expenditure where the, the, for hotels where there were workshops. The first one was for, was for the Birchwood. There was a problem, if you can just go back one slide, please. Just thank you. Where there was a workshop uh, organized uh, and the actual cost of the workshop was 260,000 but the official paid the full amount. Uh, the hotel was contacted and the hotel then refunded the department. There was no financial loss suffered by the, by the UIF. The next one, please. It's the Burgess Park Hotel. Again, here there was a, a payment made for services rendered and the matter is under investigation currently to see where and how consequential management should be taken. Uh, Chair, I would like to go to consequence management, if you will allow me. This would be on slide 45. You will recall that seven cases were received from the SIU, and four cases were finalized. Two written warnings were issued to two members of the middle management service, and two final written warnings were issued, one to the SMS and one to the management, uh, middle management. There are still three standing, uh, outstanding cases. The two SMS members, the disciplinary hearings took place last week, and we are waiting. One, I think, continued, and we're waiting for the sanction of the others. And then one outstanding case from the middle management service, this official has been on extended incapacity leave, and the disciplinary hearing will convene upon the return of the official. Then there are two cases for top management. The uh, first one is that of the commissioner. The disciplinary hearing has been finalized, and the sanction and the report has been submitted to the director general. He has referred it back with a number of questions that he had which for clarity which he requested to be clarified. So we are awaiting that return to the director general. That is the case of the commissioner. And then the second one, the disciplinary hearing, I think will take place during the course of next week for the CFO or the week thereafter. If we move to the next slide, again, this is um, uh, consequential management on irregular expenditure cases. Not going to go into detail except to say that there, there are quite a number of recommendations uh, that were made and that action must be taken. Can we move to the Accenture matter, please? This is on slide 48. There we go. So you will recall that in the previous meeting, there were quite a number of, of the school, quite, there was quite a discussion around the issue of Accenture. Uh, and the AGSA again raised a finding against the UIF regarding the procurement processes uh, around this matter of the contract for the implementation of SAP. And uh, we have received written representations from the implicated of officials. And based on that, we, the Director General at the time decided not to, to take further disciplinary action based on the recommendations. National Treasury, however, declined the condemnation, and therefore we have uh, made a submission to the Director General to approve for disciplinary action to uh, continue against officials that were not exonerated from the action against them. And a, a prosecutor, and a, we are on the next slide, sorry, Chair. Can we just move to the next slide? Thank you. So a prosecutor presiding officer has been appointed and disciplinary hearings is underway. The prosecutor and presiding officer for the two SMS members have been sourced so that the disciplinary cases can start. One complicating factor, slightly complicating, is the fact that the 
the one SMS member has left the employ of the department uh, and of the unemployment insurance fund, but is still in government. So the matter has been referred to that department so that we can continue with a disciplinary case against the official, uh, although the official is not no longer in the department. The other official is still in the department and will have to answer to the allegations. Jefferson, that takes care of the presentation. And I'm sure Advocate Yawa has rejoined us now. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you very much, um, Acting DG. All right. Um, does it end there? Is there anything else that you wish to add, uh, Minister, Deputy Minister? All right. <laughs> Colleagues, um, I'll hand over to you. Please indicate if you wish to speak. Uh, the presentation can be taken down. It just helps me view the screen when people raise their hands. Right, colleagues? Uh, I Oh, okay. I get uh, uh, over to you, Bessing it and Nitelang and Telis. Let me hand over to you and then Honorable Man and then Honorable Mkalipi in that order for now. Yeah, um, yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you and good morning to everyone. Um, Minister, yeah, the the, the I don't actually know where to start because we, we, we you, I think is general acceptance that there's so much wrong and so much to be fixed um, that, that, you know, we go over it time and time again and, and, um, and we, 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 yeah, we, we don't actually get to the end of it, but in terms of the forensic investigation, um, I was somewhat disappointed in the correspondence um, that indicated that the the investigation hadn't yet started um, and and was only due to start in a month's time um, or this month, I think, by the end of November. Can we have an explanation as to why there's been this incredible delay in, in setting up the terms of reference and finding the service provider? Um, I think this is a, an example, perhaps, of the um, of the lack of of real urgency that 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 these these um, entities seem to display about the problems. Um, but but let me hear. You know, maybe there's good reason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I share your sentiment. There's a lot uh, work that is all over, but I think we, over time we're going to streamline it. Um, yeah, but let's get a response to that question. And honourable member, stand by. Yeah, Yes, uh, Minister. Thank you very much. Yes, I am back. Uh, I was back for a while, but my system is not as stable. Good morning again, uh, Chairperson, Committee, Deputy Minister, Minister, and all of us. In, before they follow the investigation, forensic investigation, as I understand, relates to the follow the money program. And the, the reason of the slight delay is that the first tender and the contract that was concluded in terms therewith expired. But it expired before we covered the entire scope we wanted to investigate, because we wanted to have not a single company to which monies of tests were paid, not fully determined whether that money was proper and was properly used. So we had to then go back into ADVET and follow the supply chain processes until we are 
aiming, as the Honourable Member said, to have new set of appointment of the tenderers, whoever of them is successful by the end of uh, this, this month. So it's a new tender in that sense. The previous one having uh, actioned and gave us the results from which there were some monies that were returned. But when they finished in the scope that they were given, without finishing the entire uh, radius, they then had to be back into the drawing board, back into the tender, complying with all the legal processes. And we did not want, Honorable Chair, in the chase of ensuring compliance with the money paid, that we must appoint you regularly. And, and this is part of the reason why we may be said to have moved uh, slower than we should have, is to make sure that uh, every uh, 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 T is, uh, is crossed and every dot I is dotted. One of the processes, Honorable Chair, that you will know, and yes, they do effect some bit of delay, but they give us quality and assurance of a process that is free from problems is a probity exercise. And part of the probity exercise we've seen now also made it to look at the very terms of reference. You remember, Honorable Chair, the very uncensure that is an issue for years now. Part of the cause was that, as the Auditor General put up, part of the people who tendered are the very ones who set the terms of reference. And that whole chain until approval, until we are now having 96 million written off, was seen by those involved as was okay because there was not these independent eyes. Now, one of the processes that we put in place as an assurance is a property where we say, even before you publish, check these terms of reference. Are they not uh, somewhat tilted towards other outcomes, which is not what we want? Are they not bothering on other tendencies that sometimes do play themselves in the marketplace so that they are ticked, yes. And also when the adjudications and every other evaluation until appointment, that property by independent bodies continues. So it does put a little bit of a breaks, if you like, on the, sp on the speed, but it is for our good. The assurance we can give Minister, Deputy Minister, uh, Honorable Chair and the Honorable Committee members and everybody is that the road so far traveled makes us think that we'll not travel that road again. And all, all the ticks are positive and we shall appoint by end of uh, November and we shall follow everybody. So long also, perhaps we can say, although at small scale, because of the seriousness of the matters raised, we have constituted a small team of our own expertise to continue so long from where those companies left off and the ones that are being appointed are going to take off from where these officials shall have covered. And certain recoveries have also been made in the context of us using internal staff, but the magnitude really wants us to have a, an independent body. The point is that we are sure by November we shall have appointed. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. <clears throat> okay. Honorable Liz, are you good with that? Um, Mr. Chairman, I have to be. Um, yeah, that's that's the frustrating thing. Um, yeah, there's nothing more I can really add. Uh, we just got to accept what we told, I suppose. But it's, it's just very slow. Thank you. Yeah, um, I don't know. I'm I'm still processing that response. All right, uh, Honourable Mente, uh, I've noted the Ubabu Sominumam Zibula. Uh, Honorable Mente. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Uh, no, I I saw Never. Uh, that I'm not finding on the document. Perhaps they may expand on it further. The meta year risk assessment, um, when the DG, I think it's the DG who was talking earlier on, he made mention of the fact that um, some of the areas that they were looking at 
uh, they are trying to cover them up. Now, I'm trying to check if how did they categorize the issue here risk assessment pertaining to the service providers, in particular the ones that came up with the specs of designing the system which could not pick up uh, people or public servants with personal numbers, yet they were paid. And then another service provider, I'm not so sure, or the same service provider came to correct that in order for the system not to compensate uh, people who are not out of work, uh, who are actually employees of the state yet can apply all their details utilized in order to apply and access the relief fund. So I want to check uh, two things. The service provider which uh, uh, designed the system, the management that was part and parcel of the uh, specifics to identify what specifics should be uh, in order to design this particular system that will be able to pay uh, people that are out of it due to COVID. Because this has been a problem in terms of government in general, where service providers are involved in designing systems that do not really deliver the services that are required or they will just deliver a shoddy job. Same applies to the staff members or management in the department who were involved in designing these specifics of how should the system look like and how should it be designed in order for it to pick up the rightful uh, beneficiaries of this particular funding. So, uh, those are the two things I wanted to check. What, where, where is the category? What happened to that service provider and how do they deal with that particular matter? Thank you, Chair. But a response to that. Thank, thank you very much, Honorable Mente. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. This matter, Honorable Chair and the members will remember, is coming from the first audit by the Auditor General uh, around about last year when we first paid. The lessons we took from this is what the Department of Transport normally says about this time, arrive alive, speed kills. What really killed us in this was the speed with which we had to pay tests. And of course, I may possibly also say that the trust we had that public servants who sign even declaration of interest every year would not try to do something untowards. But yes, it happened that to staff of public service with personal numbers who therefore were never exposed to uh, salary loss because government continued to pay despite the COVID claimed. Yes, those matters are still under invasion by the law enforcement agencies, and we are not as yet uh, given a report to say they were claiming for themselves or they were claiming for their domestic workers and what were the circumstances. But also we know, maybe we can expand it, that also people in jail and people who are dead were paid during that round. But as the minister said in the introduction, wisened up by that audit, we went to work where we realized at start for people who are dead, there was a problem with information sharing between ourselves and the Department of Home Affairs. That the tool that was given to us as a tool by Home Affairs which we then infected into our service through that service provider, was no longer the tool that Home Affairs was using. Using that tool as was given to us by Home Affairs, those that, according to that tool, were dead, they were not paid. But that tool did not tell the latest death 
because Home Affairs changed the system that dictates dead people from a certain date. And that was a communication breakdown between us and Home Affairs. But once that was dictated and closed, presently we are working on a, on a latest tool that Home Affairs have said is the correct tool, admitting silently that the old one was wrong. In the audit that minister referred to, uh, which Auditor General did a couple of months ago, we're getting it as an exception to have a person claimed for and paid, yet that person was dead. And that really still is in the terrain where it's not our system that is asleep. It is a communication mechanism between families. Some, it's not all families who believe that when their person is dead, it's a problem of the state. They simply bury their person. And sometimes the issues of government and registrations of death happen otherwise. But what we have since done, Honorable Chair, was to say, in the wisdom that was used by men, that it is the empowerment of We then said, we are confident. And wherever it is the employer who applied and included staff that were dead, we will follow that employer. Where we may be left uh, hanging, and those become the risks of the game, is where, for example, this is a fictitious employer, or was a fictitious employer, and came with fictitious people, some of whom are dead. We are just, just there may be, no, may be a, a, but we are, no, no, no. Why is it everybody else and not you? It's home affairs, it's there. Because you see, here's, here's, here's the point which must be uh, driven home here. Answered. Is that you, you've been making payments prior COVID, eh? So ordinarily, these checks and balances should be there. It's just that what COVID has done is push the extent and scope of the work in which you are doing. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting a sense of... Uh, you, no, it's, it's everybody else, and you are seemingly a victim of shortcomings of other people. This is your system. This is your responsibility. Correct, uh, Honorable Chair. You are the ones who are innovative to create a, a functional, effective, and uh, efficient environment, of course, with your stakeholders, um, which you, 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 you work with. But I'm listening to your response. It's home affairs. It's the fictitious employers. It's the families who just bury the dead. It's not us. I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm seated here just wondering about where we're going with this. I, I'm, 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 I, I want to tell you, I'm not convinced by that response. It's, a, it's just uh, an obfuscation and it's pushing every responsibility and accountability to everyone else. Yes, we home affairs has got shortcomings. Let, let's acknowledge that. But as you continue, it's I uh Natinja, we are a victim. Mm -hmm. are not, the payouts were not a new phenomenon because of COVID. Thanks, or maybe Angibande. Yeah. Honorable Chair, thanks. Thanks. It's a correct point. Honorable Chair, I agree, and we're not responding this way to try to be angels, and every other person is the devil. But where fact is, it must be fact. Maybe the assurance we're giving is that as we speak now, all those things picked from whatever the source is, we don't have those problems. There is no audit, Honorable Chair, on our normal payments, which had said we paid a dead person. As you correctly say, we've been paying this because our systems were that. If you, you're coming as, an, uh, as a dependent, coming to claim a death benefit, our system requires you and our staff are trained to interrogate the documentation that you shall bring as proof. And once it passes that mastery, we then pay you. So we don't have in all our audits before tests, 
where we shall have a massive, even in limited case, payment of I have lost the chairman. Chairman, oh, we've lost him. Uh, chairman, right, Babu Samia. No, no, chairman. Babu, uh, why we are Israeli uh, digging himself um, in in answering uh, the question quite appropriately. The, the issue is with the failure of their own system. There is absolutely no justification of the goodness, wellness of that uh, system, which has led into uh, the outcomes through investigation of uh, millions of friends who are still lost uh, because of that system. So there's no justification. Anyone who can justify uh, that kind of operational uh, decision uh, is, is flying closer uh, to be an accomplice uh, into uh, such problems that are somewhat uh, experienced by um, the UAF. So, so the justification uh, should, should really not be uh, accepted. Uh, SIU gave us a report last week that report, that, that report uh, has given rise into the discovery of a myriad uh, of systems uh, failure, uh, which uh, presented an outlook uh, of beneficiaries, which ought to have been picked up by the system, which is really not uh, functional. Uh, uh, you see, judged in, in, in a sense, which is assisting uh, in, 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 in terms of ensuring that uh, uh, whatever payments are payments which are made to uh, those who are deserving uh, at the right at the right time. So, so any any lever uh, of justification uh, that that uh, to me is is really uh, not not right, uh, and and therefore you are correct in saying uh, you can speak about home affairs, you can speak about uh, this and that, but your decision to appoint the individuals who have installed that kind of system, they have brought you a system which is not useful uh, for value uh, in your institution. So something else must be done. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to make that interjection. Otherwise, uh... Yeah. All right. No, I think that intervention uh, w works. All right. Let us go to Honorable Kalipi. She was next. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah, well. No, we have not received an answer before. Okay. Um, All right. Okay. Again. Fine. Probe the, probe the matter further, Honorable. We Lord. have not been answered. Here, let me make an example. We were told on our oversight day when we picked up that risk assessment was the least of their worries in terms of looking into the design of the system. Ordinarily, a department like um, the Department of Labor, in fact, all departments across the board should be linked to, to each other. Now they are not in South Africa for whatever reason. The innovations of South Africa is far behind. But a design of a system that ought to pay out people, it doesn't matter how much speed you were traveling with, ought to be able to pick up that we cannot pay a person who is working. Just like Sasa is doing now in terms of the 350s, Uh, sorry, I muted my mic. Just like the SASA is doing with its own system, it picks up people, even the ones that have been working for some reason, they must come and clarify now that we are no longer, we were on contract basis and everything. So a big department like Labor is designing a system to pay out people for a relief fund 
good enough. But at the very same time, is not looking at the rest. There is two things that are possible in that scenario. One, let's overlook the risks because this will then be a way of us accessing some funds through applying uh, with the ID numbers that we, we have and ID numbers that we can and ID numbers that we can utilize. Two is that the people did not know what they were doing. Now, in my question, initially I asked, there is a, a service provider which provided the, the system, offered the system, installed the system, and helped in the design of the system. There are managers or senior managers of the department that were part and parcel of um, drafting the spe specifics of the system. What happened to the two? You named and shamed service providers that have applied for money under fictitious category, whatever it is. But you are failing to tell us the people who assisted exactly the companies now you are naming and shaming to successfully claim for dead people, successfully claim for people who did not uh, qualify to benefit into this particular relief. Babu Somio is correct. As I you told us of a whole lot of wrong things that are happening in terms of the systems of the department. Now we want to know, you have a service provider that gave you a wrong system. What happened to the service provider? What is happening to that particular system? In correcting the system, did you have to bring in new people? What happened to the previous service provider? What happened to the people who created the specifics in order for the company to deliver the services? There was a process before this. It didn't just happen. And the system was coming into an existing system of paying out. Correctly so, you are indicating that you have never had this kind of a problem. You've never come across a, a system that uh, paid out people who are dead and everything. But now when you had to pay out terrorists, somehow someone designed the wrong system. When you are probing further into it, how can someone be able to design a wrong system on top of a system that has been paying people successfully and it has never paid wrong people? So there is malice there. Where, which category are you putting that kind of a thing? Because lots of money went into paying for the system that was designed to to the money. The second thing is you are saying there the, the is... Um, in terms of the people who received uh, unduly benefited are part of the criminal justice system. Yet those people have got personal numbers. If they are part of the criminal justice system, how far is the process? What is the list? We know how many they are. How many did you send over? Because already you are justifying on their behalf that some of them were, were, were claiming on behalf of domestic workers, gardeners, and whatever, whatever. Where is that process? Who knows who was claiming for what? Because we cannot sit here and have a person who did not suffer the loss of salary, yet received a payment. And for us to receive a clear indication of who was involved in utilizing people's ID numbers or did the people with personal numbers apply themselves? We'll only know that when you are following it up and investigating it properly, because it may unearth a whole lot of syndicate that there are people who worked with people in the department, different departments to apply for money and they have accessed it successfully. Thank you, Chair. I don't know if I should go ahead, Chair. Yes, please. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. I'm trying to check on what wisdom I can use. Chair, I think we are managing a past and a present. 
the service provider who installed the system, and I agree fully with Honorable Somio, the service provider who installed the system is still the same, same service provider who, when what went wrong by the information at, our, at the disposal of the design was corrected, corrected that, and the latest audit found no problems which then says indeed that the problem was not so much with the service provider. They may have their own problems. I'm not saying they are angels as in the sense of archangels, but I'm saying the cause of what landed us last year into what we're talking about now was detected. And the detection from the angle of the source information from home affairs, putting away the wrong disk and putting in place the correct disk has resulted in the last audit saying you are not paying dead people. The service, the risk assessment were created. Eh? I'm sure I'm not. <laughs> I'm not sure that uh, maybe we didn't reflect this is what we did. Our assessment uh, the entire was that our weakness to get to that stage, which is a past, was that our risk assessment, both from the angle of audit and the risk prior the action was not awake and did not do what they should have done. And that resulted in us getting to that state. But when that audit picked the issues and the causes were identified, the root causes were identified, those root causes were fixed. As we speak today, even as the minister was saying, the last audit by Auditor General didn't pick the same old items. So it says to us, yes, there are problems, but the problem is not so much the service provider in that sense, but is the information at our disposal around which all the designs were done, which was a wrong disk. When those designs were changed and done on the correct risk disk, we're not having dead people paid. We are not having people in jail paid. We are not having people who should not be paid uh, paid. I think I can keep it at that, but the point about the risk that it was not as it should have been, and it cost to be done, but that was corrected. The present tense is a totally different picture, Chair. Thanks. All right. No, no, no. It, 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 it's fine. Um, I, 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 I guess what this speaks to is the... Silo and operations, rather, uh, of departments, and an absence of integrated checks and balances about these things. Um, but yes, it's fine. We will peg it at that momentarily. Um, yeah, Honorable Mkalepi. Uh, Chair, yeah, Chair, maybe, maybe just before Honorable Mkalepi. Can I can I just yeah, make a, a, a small Honorable uh, Okay. No, no, Chair. What I wanted to to, to say is, I think uh, indeed there is a problem with our IT our IT systems. We we would still need to do a serious upgrade. We're continuing to do it, but uh, service should not stop as we are dealing with that IT upgrade. That, that's what we are strapped in. But I would want you, Chairperson, as members of SCOPA, as you deal with this matter, also look at the efficiency and the effectiveness of the whole IT or government IT system, what we call the CETA system. Because I, this, we can't go outside, we have to rely on the CETA system. And I know that a number of de departments are disappointed about this particular matter. I, I'm not trying to be defensive, but I think uh, there's something which you must further probe, I mean probe in relation to the whole CETA system of, of government as an IT system, which uh, we are not allowed to simply go outside and look whatever Rolls Royce outside. But I thought that I must just make this comment. Thank you, Chair. 
All right, uh, Minister, that point about CETA is noted. We are aware of the perennial headache that is CETA. Uh, but ultimately, uh, yeah, no, let me leave it at that for now. Honorable Mkalipi. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Um, well, Chair, the UIF section in the department in Jay, is, is having a challenge. Uh, Advocate Yalwa and the minister will know because I always call them uh, whenever there is a, a challenge that uh, an ordinary South African needs um, an intervention. It's very difficult to assess uh, the UIF in the department. For instance, let's say you go to, maybe you stay in Eastern Cape, and then uh, you, you ought to go to a labor center in the Eastern Cape. Firstly, you are going to have such a problem whereby even the employees of the department will just uh, send you from pillar to post. And then you'll ask for an intervention from national level to say, please, can we intervene on this case? For instance, there is a link between SASA and the UIF. And quite often, there is a case that I'm dealing with now, Chairperson, of a person who she's telling me that, no, she applied for this 350 at SASA, and then SASA told her that, no, we are still receiving the UIF. And since she last got her UIF uh, in July, so now is November, but the system, the database is not updated in terms of uh, the, the UIF section. So that is my point to say that, no, the whole system in the UIF needs to be reduced and then it needs to be corrected because uh, people are very frustrated when they want to assess their UIF to start with. The second one that I want to agree with honorable members here is to say that, no, man, the department must not be seen as they are justifying and they are difficult. Remember, we are dealing with UIF here, whereby people have lost their employment and is the only source of income that they have left with. And now when they want to go and assess their terms, their UIF, now the department, who is the last result in their life, is not helping them. So I think the challenge is, I was there, Chairperson, when we were visiting or when we were having an oversight. And then I remember very well, even the chair of the Portfolio Committee of Employment and Labor raised an issue around uh, those uh, people who were working at the IT section. They were not even serious during that visit. While they are feeling that we are dealing with sensitive matters, critical matters, which have could be a, an intervention to our people with this high unemployment in this country. Now the presentation from the acting DG, it's also leave me with a, an egg in my face. When he, she is telling us that uh, about um, there's a written off on the wasteful expenditure about millions that she's telling us that no, they decided according to the processes to write off those millions. And as a result, 14 million is, a, is the one that now is there. So we, we need to know how do you arrive in that uh, a decision just to write it off? Because even if there's an X, there's laws, there's policies that allows you to write off, but it must not be just easy for you to say, no, I'm going to write off these millions because these millions could have gone and, and help our people. On the issue, I think one of the colleagues have raised this issue of name and shame, and the acting DDG is saying that when they wanted to send the names of the companies who have committed crime to the national treasure, they also wanted to get a legal opinion. And the legal opinion said, no, on the agreement that we have signed with these companies who have committed crime, we are, we are talking about people who have committed crime who have taken money that's supposed to go and be used for the benefit of the poorest of the poor. And then now we want to be reasonable as the department to say, because it's not included in the agreement, it seems as if the department is not serious in fighting crime. You can't be telling us that here, yeah, no, the legal opinion uh, 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 advise you otherwise. In fighting crime. So it means those people, they can continue fighting crime using the department if that's how we are going to reason as the department. So maybe we can be given other uh, 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 reasons here because you go and source your legal opinion, come also to the department, and then as a department committee now, 
because she, she told us about the audit committees and so on and so on. Come and tell us how did you arrive on taking that legal opinion? There's, in Parliament, Chair, we also use different legal opinions because our aim is to combat crime. So this thing does not occur well with us. And secondly, I didn't see if she also told us is how many companies as the department find out that no, those ones were claiming fraudulently and they were not supposed to, 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 to claim. You know, Chair, when um, there was a, a minister announced that no, the SIU is going to work with the department, we were all happy because we know very much what does that mean when there's a UIF that is mis, uh, misused, as a result, the person who's supposed to receive this UIF money didn't receive it. But now it seems as if the department is coming with all sorts of uh, uh, justification in order for those companies not to be taken into task. So I want to get that clarity, uh, Chairperson, going forward. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Anum Khalib. In fact, can we get that legal, legal opinion? Um, so that we can just um, send it to our legal people. Um, that was referred to. Thanks for reminding uh, me, Honorable Khalif, on that one. All right, let's get a response to that. And then, Babu Samuel, you'll come in. Um, th thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. We agree fully with Honorable Khalif. Um, there is, there is, it's not always easy. Uh, for our clients across the length and breadth of the country to get the services we offer with ease. Not all of them, but there are some where really things are not as, as good as we want. In the, in the revamp that the minister talked to, where he said that the, a service provider is appointed, one of the things we want to scrutinize is culture, and styles of offering of service. Yes, we accept our systems also, that's why they're part of that process, is that when they're properly, when they are properly programmed, if maternity leave mm, Babiawa, all right, and then all right. Advocate, you are muted. Thank right. you. Thank you. It, just, it just kicks me out uh, these systems. Maybe it's because we're talking about systems. Uh, I was using an example to admit that our systems, we, that's why we have them as, a, as an overhaul, over and above, even wanting to get out of the uh, CETA platform. If, for example, a maternity leave in law is a four months issue, a properly set up system, once that four months is up, must know that. And it therefore cannot say, I'm using that as an example, it cannot then say to somebody who goes to Sasa or another government or another place for a service that they qualify for. Then that system is talking a past tense that you are receiving a maternity, yet that was then. We did see those examples also in, a, in a, when we're paying tests, that in the attempt to avoid double dipping, it would be good at some point and say, no, this person is receiving a normal other benefit, therefore cannot claim from tests. But we did experience these issues where the system talks at past tense to the frustration of people who agree with that. It's part of that uh, revamp. Uh, and we also agree that culture uh, within, within uh, staff and service, uh, client handling techniques are not as best all the time and we're working on those in terms of trainings and, and, other, and other mechanisms. On the legal opinion, we'll provide the legal opinion, Chair Fence, but I think one of them also helped it better when he says, give us other reasons. And the other reasons, really the major reason that uh, left us in this state, we said to the people Gali, we are prosecuting those who are identified from the follow the money and were arrested by the law enforcement agents. We're following them criminally. And the, the law system of the country is that once you've got a conviction criminally, it then allows you to go for your civil, which then makes you to get some of the money. Some of the monies are frozen as things stand now. Yeah. They cannot be taken to us 
because they are pending a finalization what the court should ultimately say. Are we right? Are those other people right? And then it is pending those legal platforms. The key thing that was, was a factor, and I stopped at this, is the other reason, is that the laws passed by our parliamentarians, including the Constitution itself, the Supreme Law, it says everyone is assumed innocent until proved guilty. Investigation is a root proving, it's not a proof. The investigation gets subjected to a judge who listens to all who want to say, and then make a proof that this one is right, that one is wrong. Of course, then those proofs are not as fast as they love. And that was one of the warnings that if you start off by shaming, you are already saying you have proved this person to be guilty of fraud. Yet at this stage, it's an allegation which is found to be so by an investigation, but the last word is a court of law. You are not a court of law. You will not be correct before a court of law says, yes, you are if we agree with you, this was fraud. Yes, uh, SIU or whatever the investigating board. So that is the issue that caused us to then say, let's allow the legal processes to go. That's what the victim teacher said in the presentation. Follow the legal route until conclusion. And once there is a pronouncement, it makes you to do whatever, including shaming, from a short point, free from risk of being no, uh, So that was the other reason. Thank you, Chair. No, I, I, I think we're going to get technically theoretical here. Um, I, I don't think the substantive matter is on the phrasing of naming and shaming, but these are public disclosures that are necessary. Fundamentally, because there is no legal process that is done behind the scenes, I think that's the that's the issue that members have been raising. I know that maybe the phrasing of naming and shaming is one which will be <clears throat> be challenged, but I think in its essence it does not imply that. But what the has been a major and perennial headache is the fact that there is seemingly is no urgency to speed in how things move. And ultimately, the perception is that there is a protectionism going on. So yeah, we, we, we are quite uh, well aware of the legal nuances of court processes and so on and so forth. But these are public funds. And what we are saying is that don't do these things in secret. If you are charging Mkulego Incorporated for something they've done, <clears throat> tell us that we as the UIF are in court with Mkulego Incorporated because of ABCD. I think that is <clears throat> that's that's the issue um, with that. But yeah, so I think I just wanted to to clarify that particular aspect. Uh, Minister, I saw your your hand, your physical hand. Yes, so yes, I yes. I think the yes. issue advocate is transparency here. That's the principle in which we are trying to establish, mm -hmm. and taking the public along and taking okay, Parliament it. along, and so on. Would see. The, we are dealing with the legal matter with so and so. Yeah, we know. So maybe I, I, you, 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 I get your frustration in terms of the terminology, name and shame, but I don't. That's yeah. All right, Minister, and then Babu Somi will come in. No, no, I thought uh, I must just intervene and uh, request the uh, advocate as a response to be direct to the issues instead of uh, long-winded answers and examples which might end up uh, digging the hole for, for him. Just direct issues. And uh, we must be able to say, no, no, here it's work in progress. And given the fact that this matter is legal and otherwise it's not going at the speed at which we, 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 we want. And uh, just concede on some of, 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 of the areas. That's what I I was trying to I'm, I'm trying to, to raise to him. Thank you very much. Yeah, I I I think we want that legal opinion. And we, 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 
in fact, I think what we also want uh, now is, and colleagues will, 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 I'm sure will agree with this, let's get the full schedule of all the matters in which you are engaged in legally so that we can see where they are, when they started, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, because I, I think at some point, uh, colleagues, the, we, we do need to uh, have a very frank discussion with the Department of Justice and the Office of the Chief Justice. Uh, because some of the matters are stuck on court rules. And that's just not acceptable, actually. The slow pace with which, which cases are moving. I know some may be stuck with NPA and law enforcement agencies. That's one category. But there are matters that are stuck on court rules. And the courts are just, they are not helping, actually. I mean, I think that Parliament is well within its rights as, an, as another arm of the state to raise these issues with another arm of the state. To say, look, you need to move with speed because you are holding up a, 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 a critical uh, space of public accountability with regards to public funds. Because you see, these delays cause a build up and a frustration in the system. It's just, I think, speedy, logical, legal conclusions on matters must be a priority. So I think that frank discussion is actually long overdue. I, I think it would not be an overreach as well, uh, and not an interference. It would just says, get going, actually. So I think there's that. Okay, Babu saw me. Okay, before Babu saw me, okay. I didn't get Let's an talk. answer. Regards to the data of UIF where by a person last get his hey, UIF in July. Okay. All right, please just stand by one second and then we'll come in after this response. Okay. No, 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 sure. A response, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I thought we did. We are saying we accept that our system is not up to scratch all the time. That's why I was using that example of a maternity leave. The person maternity leave ran and finished. The system should be saying presently, at the time it finishes, it finished. But there are moments where it still says other people are on maternity. It affects them, like the example of Sasa, when they need something else on the other side. But what we did with SASA, and it's unfortunate that it still becomes a problem, SASA wrote to us to say to avoid double dipping, give us the whole data of everybody who is in your system receiving or once received something. We send them that data electronically, that these ones up to that date used to receive, they are no longer receiving now. These ones are still receiving, and their receiving will end at that date. But we still get situations even on people who uh, know people within the department, that Sasa is saying you are paying me, and yet you are not paying me. And we continue to talk to Sasa. Look at the paragraph X of the data we gave you. It says that was the case, it's no longer the case now. So there are some moments where it's, it's interworkings between government and maybe management of information that shall have been given. We gave a data at the instance of Sasa of all people who are in our system receiving uh, benefits or who once received benefits, and when did that end? They worked well with some of them, but there's still some where people get that frustration that the owner member is, is making. We accept that, and we're working with us. Thanks. Okay, I will sum you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, uh, the, the, the minister has uh, anticipated my uh, uh, view uh, on, on how these uh, questions are somewhat uh, uh, handled, but uh, let me appreciate his uh, intervention. Uh, the, the, the issue here is, is with us seeking to ensure that 
um, the entity uh, rise high on ethical uh, conduct. And, and uh, in doing so, uh, it should as well assert its own responsibility uh, on the authority it has um, on, on ensuring that people uh, remain accountable. They are always accountable for what they have done wrong or rightly. And, and in that instance, uh, appropriate action uh, should be taken uh, on such uh, uh, areas. Here, here we are, um, a, a, a system uh, which uh, sought to interfere with, with all good cause uh, in ensuring that those who are uh, experiencing hardship at the time uh, should uh, receive uh, the state's intervention in good time in, in a manner which is a, a somewhat consummate uh, to uh, their right uh, at, that, at that time. And the system fails them, and it does not only fail them, it even fails the very same objective. Uh, as something which the minister correctly has indicated that, yes, indeed, uh, there is a level of a, a problem uh, overall uh, on the state technology um, uh, in as far as a responsible body uh, is concerned. Something which should be pushed um, uh, quite properly, that CETA uh, uh, should, should ensure at all times that the state uh, should not fail uh, because of their failure uh, to do what is right uh, at all times in terms of providing uh, such necessary technologies which link the entirety of the system uh, of the state to avoid such risks and failures which could cost uh, a lot uh, of money in terms of fiscals and, and uh, more than anything else which could uh, cost uh, uh, the security of the state uh, generally. So, so, so it is incumbent upon that institution, which we must uh, as well at some at some stage of fine time as the committee, uh, to bring them uh, in the fore uh, to uh, probe these uh, kinds uh, of uh, failures of act in as far as these matters uh, are concerned. So, so, so my view, I think, uh, as expressed by a number of colleagues here. Is, is whether even those who are in your IT system, IT space, your own officials are, are up to the game. They, they are equal to the task uh, in, in dealing with these matters because there's no use to import a system uh, into your own environment and you don't have those individuals who are equal to that task so that they should as well uh, be able to run with such processes. And, and when such uh, failures are identified, they should act promptly uh, to restore uh, some kind of uh, uh, ethical route uh, which is acceptable uh, for the operations uh, in, your, in, your, in your environment. So, so I think uh, uh, with, uh, with a view expressed by the minister uh, that uh, uh, you are uh, seeking to progress uh, around these uh, uh, matters is identified, uh, it, it, it might be uh, that uh, we really need to uh, give that space uh, for such to happen. But the question mark remains, uh, if that happens, uh, do we have officials who are equal to the task? I can qualify that question by saying when we went, when we were there, there was a simple question asked on a matter which involved uh, procurement uh, of a services uh, uh, of, uh, uh, I think it was a matter that uh, related to advocacy uh, on these programs, where a choice was even outside of what exists uh, currently uh, within government, within the state uh, itself, uh, the choice which was itself illegal and uh, found through investigations by the SIU as having jumped uh, you see the actual prescribed route in terms of procurement. And, and our probe found arrogance uh, in the officials who were handling uh, that uh, a kind of a procurement uh, involved in the procurement process uh, who asserts the fact that they would have run the process 
uh, in a usual manner. And they even questioned uh, the Auditor General's assertion uh, on, on that uh, a procurement process, so something which uh, now has been confirmed by the SIU that that is the fact, uh, uh, you know. So, so, so uh, it becomes very necessary uh, that uh, if you have an institution which uh, is closer uh, to the well-being uh, of the downtrodden masses, people who have uh, absolutely nothing except to run to that uh, insurance fund from uh, the time of need, uh, they should uh, receive uh, what uh, they ought to um, uh, in terms of the law. And, and uh, we, we find the space of those who occupy uh, such a, a operational environment who are indeed uh, not uh, equal to that, uh, that challenge. So, so, so to, 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 to you, uh, Commissioner, uh, uh, I, I think there is a need uh, uh, for a guarantee to act on those matters. Consequence management. Consequence management. Consequence management. Uh, you know, the, the public fiscus should not accommodate those who scale uh, less value uh, out of uh, what uh, they, uh, is a need to uh, uh, somewhat meet the demands of our own uh, communities. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Babu Um All right, let's get a reaction to that. Um, and then, Mamzibola, you will come in uh, afterwards. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I think we agree, Honorable Chair. Uh, I, I think the point about what the Minister said about seed time and so on, I think uh, Honorable Somio is agreeing with that. But on the point about the fitness of our own staff and the arrogances, not only did the SIU, Honorable Somio, and the members say that was out of out of tune, an independent chairperson in all the cases that it was, uh, the acting DG presented, there's not a single official of those who were confronted with that in a disciplinary hearing was found innocent. So all their protestations and, if you like, arrogance that they are right, that's how it should have been done, were not proved. They were given a platform to justify themselves in whatever way they believe, independent person and the pr prosecution that the employer put in proved them all wrong. So all those cases uh, got to that space. So we agree fully. We also agree that beyond that, our attitude, our fitness, our commitment must be a constant uh, watch and we agree fully. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Perhaps, Chair, with your permission? Yes. Uh, I know I'm trying to avoid these long answers. Uh, the minister, we have in the department what we call an ICT advisory committee. It's constituted of independent people from the department. And, and they did give a report which was interrogated by the department and accepted that uh, our ICT uh, capability is not at the level that it should be at. Um, and these are some of the things that are being attended to the remedial actions. Uh, recommended from that uh, audit. So I think it's part of the admission that, yes, uh, it's not as where we want to be, but there's a plan to try and so salvage that situation. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, no, um, all right, uh, Minister. Um, okay, okay, let's, and then the acting, the acting DG as well, and then Mamzi, will I just stand by? Jefferson uh, and honorable members, we have heard you loud and clear, uh, Comrade Somio. It's a matter we've been talking about the issue of the capacity uh, in, in, in our IT unit, including the issues which you're talking about of consequent management, consequent management. We, we assist with those issues. And I think when we come back with a report next time, will be able to give a progress report. Truth be told, um, Yawa refers to a report which was done by experts who were very clear of what has to be implemented. And um, 
it's clear that because of capacity, I don't want to say arrogance, uh, some of the people were not supposed to be there. So this is a matter which we are dealing with with the, with, with, with the DG along the lines of what uh, uh, Comrade, I mean, uh, Honorable Somio is, was, 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 was raising. We've zeroed in now on this IT uh, question. Um, well, it might take time, but it's a matter where we could be able to give a progress report uh, next time, even if it means you call us just for that particular item as to how far are we are we doing in relation to that matter. We will be ready to come and give a report early next year. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Minister. Um, I had seen that, okay, the D acting DG has taken a hand down. All right, Mamzi Bula, you can come in. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. Uh, Minister, honorable members, and officials uh, present. No consequence You can hear me. Everything is blank this side. No consequence at UIF at all. And don't they request SIU to investigate their irregular expenditure instead of using expensive audit, audit firms? Can they supply scope with the amount of the forensic uh, firms they used. Thank you, Chair. Okay. All right, thanks, Mom Zebula. Can we get a response to that, please? Thank you, thank you, Honorable Chair. I'm sure uh, what what the forensic audit cost can be forwarded to the committee. We shall comply, Chair. Thank you. No, 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 no. Chair. Chair. You need to stop? I think I must emphasize this. There are issues. There are issues which um, the SIU can investigate as long as they are in the proclamation. But there are issues which need a follow-up which are not necessarily in the proclamation. We have to investigate those issues on our own. And one of, of, of the realities we must accept, uh, Chairperson, is that, uh, I don't know what the SIU will say about this, but we must be honest that there are certain investigations we gave them last year, they are not yet complete. Some of the cases where They've given us complete uh, and recommendations. We've acted on those. But there are some which are still in the process, and we have to wait for them. And the reality is uh, the SIU service is the whole of government. Um, sometimes the processes are not as fast as we want them as we want them to, 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 to be. They, they, they take a very long route. But that's, that's why then sometimes on some of the small and short things, we have just to appoint our own forensic forensic people. But also when it comes to uh, the issues of the normal finances, we just have to rely on the forensic auditors, not necessarily on, on, the, on, on the SIU, because they tend to look at the criminality part of it. But I thought I must, I must explain that. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, no. I, 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 I hear that, and it's of course always good that the SIU is here. Um, I see Ubabu Leru is here, and I saw Babu Khanya who's here. But Babu Leru, I'm not sure if the is the head of unit is present this morning. Ah, there we go. All right, Babum Tib, can we come to you, please? Progress on the investigations. Yes. How far are we? No, thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, let me just start off firstly by thanking the Honorable Chair and Honorable Members for the opportunity to comment. 
and thank the Honourable Minister uh, for the for the inputs. Uh, and, and also, of course, greetings to uh, our colleagues at the department and UIF and my colleagues. Chair, so I, 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 I'm, I'm really delighted at this opportunity. I wanted to just say on record, as I said to Scopa last week, that uh, we will reach out uh, to the department and specifically UIF. Uh, this based on the investigations that we've done and the findings that we have made based on the evidence that we gathered, including the systemic recommendations for improvement that we have, that we have made. And this we do, and we don't just do uh, only with the, with the UIF, we've done it with several state institutions, and we have found that it, it works and works well in terms of achieving, achieving our objective, which is uh, uh, part of the legislative mandate of SIU of investigating serious maladministration, malpractice and corruption. So on the, on the maladministration part, the converse of that is improving administration of the state. So, our view is over and above investigating, dealing with those who are responsible, holding them to account, and instituting civil proceedings, not having to wait for criminal cases, and ensuring that we reach the outcomes. Another important aspect is to ensure that the administration of the state improves. And that we do by engaging with the state institutions where we've investigated. And we will reach out to UIF to ensure that we share with them our findings, we'll engage with them, and indicate where improvements have to be made. And that could inform their risk management or risk assessment process, inform the risk mitigation plans going forward. Now, uh, with regard to the uh, investigations that we are busy with at the, uh, at the department, and not necessarily uh, uh, UIF itself. Um, I've, I've taken note that the minister said there are some of the cases that they were referred last year and they're still waiting. Uh, look, my colleagues are in the meeting, but I don't want to go uh, into detail on those because we don't have the details now, uh, honorable chair and honorable members. I would like to ensure, uh, as we have committed to this committee, that we would like to improve the turnaround times of the investigations so that we become the preferred forensic investigation agency and litigation agency for the state so that the forensic private companies are not the first port of call. For obvious reasons that we would like to ensure that the state gets its services within the state, so to speak. Uh, so we will, we will reach out and, and once I've done this, uh, this check with my colleagues in terms of the matters that have been sent to us last year and which ones are still outstanding, uh, I will, I will uh, reach out to the Honorable Minister's office so that we can then present. And uh, when we next appear at SCOPA, we'll, we'll indicate uh, uh, what, what the status of those, uh, of those matters are. Um, yeah, in, in the... In, in the Minister's comment, and I'm sure perhaps we did not, perhaps we did not come out clear uh, in our interactions, perhaps with the minister before. Uh, we don't. We, we although we do, we look at criminality. Yes, corruption is a crime, and we look at other crimes that are committed. But mal maladministration, uh, in the main, it's uh, it's administrative in nature. It may not be underlined by criminal actions. And we look at that to ensure that uh, the administration uh, improves. But we also look at uh, the civil part, uh, where the state has lost uh, the money uh, so that we can, we can recover. But uh, I just wanted to make that, uh, that part clear. But we will reach out, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, to the minister and just appraise the minister on the status of our investigations. Thank you very much. 
Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Babu Yawa. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I, and I don't want to, <clears throat> well, whilst I answered this question at first, just by saying we shall provide the cost, uh, I was trying to ask myself, will I be appearing defensive or blaming others than, than us? Two examples, Chair, without just for the record, and we, we accept what the SIU is saying. I read in the press last week that SIU is saying there's some 6,000 public servants who were paid tests. And there was a comment that says UIF is sleeping on the job. I asked the chief risk officer at the UIF, what is this? And the report we have is that those matters are not even investigated by SIU. They are in the hawks where we participate. They are still under investigation. There's no report, therefore there's no consequence we can take. And part of what we're wondering is how then does SIU report on matters that are investigated by other bodies? but perhaps they've got a mechanism between themselves they may know. Some staff within UIF, and they're in senior leadership, were suspended about the time the test issue emerged and the investigation was given to SIU. Almost after a year, SIU comes to us and says, sorry, it's outside our battery. We can't uh, give you a conclusive report. We, we've got no authority on this item. After a year, and then they say they're giving it to other law enforcement agencies. And to date still, there is not a report yet, and therefore there can be no consequence. So that some of those, but we are happy when the SIU is saying, we'll exchange notes and close the gap so that, uh, as, as you correctly says, SIU remains the preferred uh, mechanism for speedy resolution of these matters. Otherwise, in some of the instances, our experience, the senior managers, parliament keeps asking us, how much have you paid to date for the suspended people? And we're talking millions. And I think the point that the owner member was making at first, UIF, no consequence. Some of the points is that how do we start when matters are still pending investigation for periods even beyond a year? Or they are not within us. They are in the law enforcement agencies. And one of us reports that UIF is sleeping on duty. Why should we wake up to what duty? when the investigation report is not yet with us. It's with those bodies who are in law entrusted to investigate those matters. And we're told these 6,000. We don't have a report of 6,000 public servants released to us. The one we know by those who are entrusted, they are still investigating. But in the public domain, UIF is sleeping on duty. Thanks, Chair. All right. Chair, Chair, just through you, sorry, I couldn't, I, I couldn't find the option to, to, to raise the hand. Uh, so with, with, right. with your permission, Chair, just one second. I, I was coming to you indeed before. No, thank you. Right. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, uh, uh, without really uh, elaborating on this matter, I hear my colleague, he's got a different view. And... Uh, We've got, we've got no issues with that. Uh, but I think it's going to serve us well uh, if these matters are raised directly with us so that we can interact with the department or UIF and engage in terms of uh, if, if there's a reconciliation of numbers that we need to do so that we appraise them on where we come from with our report. Because as we sit today, we still stand on our report. Uh, so, Chair, with your permission, as I said, we'll reach out to, to, to UIF uh, and, and, and appraise them and give them the basis of our findings and how we have come to our findings. So, Chair, I really just wanted to put that on record that. Uh, uh, our investigations are evidence-based and our findings are also evidence-based. If anybody has got a different view, uh, there are legal processes to challenge our reports uh, so that uh, it can be, it can be uh, ventilated out there. But we'll reach out, we'll reach out to you, IF. Thank you. Um, right, uh, all right, uh, Minister. Yes. 
Yes, 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 Chairperson. It's 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 incorrect to quote newspaper reports because newspaper reports uh, tend to be cooked mm -hmm. and and I think uh, advocate uh, from the SIU is correct. Advocating team. Let's just deal with what the SIU has delivered. We've met with SIU several times. We're still going to meet with the SIU. So we must raise our concerns there. But uh, if we're going to rely on the newspapers, advocate our, it's not good. So let's not even go there. It's, it's a problem. Let's, let's leave it there. It was enough to say there are recommendations which have been made where we're supposed to implement. There are other outstanding issues with the SIU is still coming. Let's just leave it there. Thank you, Chairperson. So I think let, let's do this because uh, I, I think uh, what is quite clear here is that you are speaking past each other quite clearly. Um, and the minister is saying there are matters that have uh, been with the SIU for over a year. Uh, the SIU will go to its records. Um, I'm, I'm not going to really uh, respond to the issue of the media reports. Um, suffice it to say, from whatever angle or perspective you look at it, there are shortcomings in the UIF system uh, and the lack of coordination and integration at a broader level of the security cluster in the flow and protection of information is a factor. It is not deniable that there are shortcomings with the UIF system. People who shouldn't have been paid were paid. Um, and there is, yeah, and when we were there, of course, the, the problems are very clear for us to see. Um, head office simply not coping in terms of the call center and, and, and so, I think that 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 issue, if it were a concern, it really is a drop in the ocean because the broader fundamental reality is it's common cause that there are lapses. So let's do this then. UIF uh, department and SIU. Um, we would like you to, I think, set up a meeting between yourselves. Uh, within the next 10 days uh, to thresh out on all these issues, find each other and uh, provide a clarity then to us that you have met. Um, and these are the issues that you have agreed on and where you've disagreed, you indicate to us as well, so that we get that report before we close uh, parliament uh, for this year. So that all these matters in their intricacies and in their detail can be threshed out. And uh, so the timeline, it will enable us then to put in place timelines because these investigations must be concluded um, as well. Um, and then I'm sure Advocate Mtibi, you can share the presentation you, sh you, you made to us uh, last week with the uh, UIF uh, at that meeting so that they will be uh, on the same page as us um, and uh, move, uh, move, move, move along. So <clears throat> the two, two offices uh, to coordinate a date for a meeting within the next 10 days, advise us when you're meeting. It might not be a report that you will send to us, but at the very least a summary or a, 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 a briefing a briefing note to say you have met and you have resolved on a, a, a way forward in this manner or that way and clarified the issues. Because the one thing we must never ever do, either as parliament, government departments or institutions of the state, is to speak to each other through the media. It is the highest level of uh, unprofessionalism uh, for us to engage each other 
uh, through an intermediary as if we can't speak. There's no need for a middleman uh, or middle woman uh, in, 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 in engaging. Um, and uh, yeah, Minister, I think I, I, I would want to concur. Uh, let us let, let us not arrive at conclusions on the basis of media reports um, because they are a snapshot of a particular perspective and angle of a meeting and an interaction. So if the uh, the presentation is available and will, will be sent to you. So I think let's do that so that there is progress uh, on the UIF uh, Employment and Labor Department and SIU engagement colleagues. I hope that 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 um, that proposal suffices to sort of just uh, tie things down and 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 and, and align them properly uh, for engagement. So that's just the proposal I'm making. We'd let them meet and 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 talk to each other and speak to each other. Um, on the matters, some of them have been raised by the minister, and some have been raised uh, by the head of unit. So, colleagues, it's just that proposal I wanted to make. I hope it's an order. It is an order, Chair. So you're here. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Agreed. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Right. Thanks, colleagues. Right. Are there any now? So, <clears throat> I think what we we want. Uh, Minister, UIF and Compensation Fund have not tabled their annual reports. Why? Why have they not tabled? I think let's get an explanation of that uh, because it has a fundamental bearing on the injunction of the committee that you know, over five years of disclaimers, year on year, or close to 10, uh, of, of a, a poor, poor audit outcome year in, year out. Um, and that's why we want this forensic investigation. And now we are settled with the non-submission or tabling. So can we get a, an explanation on, on that particular one? Thank you, Chair. Can I request the... The, the acting TG together with the two commissioners or and the acting commissioner, just to give an explanation, acting TG. That's fine. Thank you, uh, Minister Chairperson. These two, <clears throat> excuse me, annual reports have not been tabled because the audits by the Auditor General have not been finalized. I'm told that the audit of the compensation fund is far advanced and that they hope to table before Parliament rises. The audit from the UIF has still got some distance to go, and I don't think that would happen in terms of tabling. So the reason for the delay in tabling is because the audit of the Auditor General has not been finalized yet. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Is AG present today, Sister Mbi uh, I think so. Ah, oh, yes, there's this Khabu. Yes, right. Okay, um, let's just uh, get the two commissioners first and then we'll come to you, A.G. Good to see you. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. If I could start and maybe Commissioner Mafata finishes. Uh, it's correct what uh, the acting teacher said. I just wanted to add that there was a, a letter written from the department to the responsible committees in parliament explaining the predicament and making a request for end September as a, as a date when the finances shall be forwarded to AG. And that was done, hence then AG is still busy with our, our audit. So I just want to add that small part, but I agree fully with all that was said. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Mafata. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Chair, and good morning to the Honourable Members. Yes, Chair, I think as in addition to what the, the DG has said, so the ad, from the compensation fund's point of view, so we did request uh, to submit the financial statements to National Treasury and to the Auditor General two months later than required, which is on the 31st of July. And the main reason there was that the information that we needed from the unlisted investments that are managed through the PIC 
to be able to account for, to equity account for them in our financials had not been uh, submitted in full by the end of, the, of May. So we then waited for all that information to come through. And at the end of July, we then submitted the financials for, for audit. We have just concluded the process of audit with the AG. The, audit, uh, the draft audit report was presented to the audit committee on Monday. We are now in the final steps of uh, finalizing the uh, financials and annual report and also waiting then for the final signed audit report so that we can submit the annual report to uh, to the minister to table in parliament. Thank you, Chair. So, okay. So the, my, so the the audit is not complete because of the late submissions on your part. Because the implication of the first statement made it sound as if the AG had not completed Granted, there was a late submission on your part. Am I correct? Correct, Chair. Correct, yeah, Chair. Correct. Uh, if we yeah, come across that. Yeah. yeah, it's what I, I've been saying. It, it's always them, not us. All right, AG. Uh -uh. Um, Good morning, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members, um, the Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, and the colleagues from the entities and the department. Um, mine is just to confirm, Chair, that yes, the, the two entities submitted late, and our teams were working very hard to try and finalize. Um, and yes, we do concur with the compensation fund that so far as CF is concerned, we are almost finalizing. Um, we've already tabled at audit committee. We finalized all the engagements at audit really is just to get to, to sign the report and, and release it to, through to them. But the, the UIF submitted later than the compensation fund. They came through only on the 30th of November. So that audit, we're still working hard at it. Um, it will definitely not make it for um, end of end of November as, as, as we are speaking. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Um, yeah, so... I think it would have been just so much better if the initial response was mm. we submitted late and therefore the AG is delayed because once of we're creating a perception that's like AG is not doing what they must do. We must hold the AG accountable for things which sit at their doorstep. I'm sure we will saw you in, the, in as chair of the standing committee on the AG with the Gracie. I I, I say this to implore on you, colleagues, that uh, let us let us just generally be frank um, on, on 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 things, right? Acting DG, I see your hand. Jefferson, uh, yes, I apologize for the way that I made it sound. You are correct. We were late. So I apologize to my colleagues at the AG. It is not their fault that the audit is not finalized. Thank you, Chair, for correcting that. Right. Thank you very much, um, Acting DG. All right. So let us then await um, those issues to be finalized and submitted. Uh, we'll await the briefing back, the brief back from the meeting which must sit. Uh, in the uh, as per earlier on, um, so that uh, because we want, uh, Minister, we want that forensic investigation because almost over, no, not almost over five years, close to 10 of disclaimed audit outcomes. We want that one. Uh, and I hope that a, a, a very clear timeline will be put in place for it. If it does not arrive with that briefing note, we will impose a deadline. Because I've got a, I've got a new phrase of late, I'm trying to be consistent with my youth. Something has got to give. And I, 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 I want to say, if people must be fired, let us fire them. 
let's not let, 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 let's let's really really uh, disabuse this tendency of wanting to protect wrongness incompetence dereliction of duty the failure to comply corruption people must walk the plank and we we are fundamentally convinced that those ordered outcomes are not a mistake they are engineered to protect and cover up something you can't be disclaimed for so long it's this poor record keeping and so on or lack of it the and and i think minister we uh, the, the one issue which i think must really be of top priority for all of us as you have raised is a drive towards uh, improved integration of systems uh, particularly in the it space of government uh, and quite frankly CETA is failing us uh, in that score um yeah. it's a dismal failure um, and i think colleagues because we will be meeting with the ministry and Department of uh, Communications when we are in uh, Gauteng for the post office uh, oversight, I think let us raise this issue with them um, so that they can have a, a, an opportunity to hear our thinking and they have to, CETA has to be fixed. In a world era now where uh, digitization and technology uh, is the new world order. We are lacking far, far behind. So, Nje, a minister there, I would agree with you. Uh, uh, broader interventions are required at CETA um, to, to actually turn things around. So I think the, 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 that clarity is needed from CETA in the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies. But that's just one stream of the work. There's work that must be done by UIF and Compensation Fund. And we are awaiting those annual reports and those audit outcomes with heightened seriousness given the track record of the very poor um, audit outcomes, which have been normalized at the two entities. And I, I, I would, I'm still interested, really, uh, when they come out. And if they come out with a similar outlook, I would really be interested from the two commissioners uh, and, and the leadership of UIF and Compensation Fund for them to seriously tell us why they should continue in their jobs. Why, why the, we, we, we should continue having them in those positions. When all these things and all these outcomes are happening on their watch, it's not things they're inheriting. Uh, these are their outcomes. These are their audit outcomes. These are their disclaimers. So I would really, really, once they come out, we want to know, why should you continue being in your job? Convince us, convince South Africa. They, they just have, something really has to give. As I said to um, ESCOM yesterday, and I put it to UIF and Compensation Fund, shape up or ship out. Yeah, it just, this thing is frustrating. Anyway, colleagues, are there any other matters that you want to raise and then we can bring it to an end there? Going once, going twice, and going thrice. Silence is consensus. All right, let me take this opportunity then to thank you, uh, my colleagues.
uh, for the very important issues you have raised, and I think we continue to sharpen the direction in which the UIF must go. It's going to take us some time, I can see, uh, but yeah, we're not going anywhere. We are still here, so we will continue in that um, uh, on that trajectory. So thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Um, Honorable Minister, Honorable Deputy Minister, thank you as well for uh, leading the delegation this morning. Um, Acting DG and your team and to the commissioners, uh, for your presence as well and for this meeting. Head of unit, the SIU and your team uh, as always, the Siabonga. And of course, to our key strategic partners, National Treasury, and uh, AG, as always, um, thank you very much. So I think we can bring it to an end there. Minister, I will hand over to you for one minute, if not two, if you've got any concluding remarks. Um, and then we will bring the meeting to an end. And colleagues, today we don't have a graveyard session. The House will meet at three for questions and consideration of some reports. So we're not meeting tonight. Uh, but I think next week we've got a graveyard session. All right, Minister, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. I must just indicate that we've taken all the, the recommendations which have been given here, and we have noted uh, the issues, our weaknesses in the IT system, and it's, it's work in progress. And uh, we have noted uh, what we have raised as the committee issues around uh, consequence management in the IT system. Of course, we will continue respecting the labor legislation as we are dealing with those issues. And I must emphasize, Chairperson, I've worked with the SIU for more than for more than eight years. There, there are no problems. There might be misunderstanding somewhere by, 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 by advocate, but there are no problems between us and the SIU. And as I've said, I want to emphasize, they constantly brief us and on the issues, on the progress, and even on the issues which they've finished, and they tell us even on the outstanding issues. So we're going to continue to have uh, these meetings we're not going to be resolving any there's no dispute between us and them it's just progress reports and updating on the various issues i must just uh, thank all the members for this and uh, thank you very much uh, chairperson okay thank you minister it's good that there's no problems so there should be no difficulty in meeting in the next 10 days Yes. Uh, and getting a briefing note from you so that we can be able to make the necessary recommendations, directives, and injunctions to take issues forward. Colleagues, on that very happy note of no problems. Um, Thank you, Chair. The gent, Thank you, All right, colleagues, take care. And please, well, 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 don't be in good band. So you well, can well, 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 yeah <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.